We're ready? Folks? Don't we think we're, we're ready to go? Yep. Wonderful. It's 7 o'clock. I will call this meeting to order. The uh, August 9th meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Scarborough. Uh, to begin with, um, I will have uh, Doreen call the roll. Peter Freilinger? Here. David Bohr? Here. Michelle Stevenson? Here. Christine Snow? Here. Joe Doherty? Here. And Richard Suckman? I'm here. And we have a quorum. Um, and I think, do we need to bring anyone to the, yeah, but do we need to bring anyone to the, uh, no, we do not, therefore. Okay, well, we'll begin then with the Pledge of Allegiance. So everyone, please rise. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first item is therefore the approval of the minutes for the July 12th meeting. Uh, do we have um, any comments before we uh, entertain a motion to approve? Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Bork. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll oh, second it. Thank you, Mr. Silkman. Uh, all those in favor, please uh, say aye or raise your hand. None opposed. They are passed un unanimously. Um, so I will now welcome us to today's regular meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, this is a public proceeding, and unless the board specifically votes to go into executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all the exhibits that are being pre presented. Please notify myself if you are unable to hear or see the proceedings. And uh, I don't see anything online right now. The board works for a prepared agenda and will take up tonight's order in the following orders. Um, the approval of the draft written decisions from the July 12th meetings, namely appeal number 2750, the special exception appeal by Elijah T.D. Holbrook, and the appeal number 2751, the special exception appeal for, by Caitlin Johnson. Um, we will also hear, hear a new appeal or actually a new appeal, it, it is sequentially an older one, but uh, a new appeal. Uh, 2749, a miscellaneous appeal by Alexander G. Tito of 565 Route 1. Um, with that in mind, why don't we um, dive right into the approval of the draft written decisions heard at the July 12th meeting. Uh, appeal number 2750, the special exception appeal, um, the home occupation uh, request for a, 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 a seafood um, or a shellfish stand by Elijah Holbrook on 137 Beach Ridge Road. Has the board has a, had a chance to read the, to review the findings of facts, and do they meet with what we de determined last month? I move that we approve it. Thank you, Richard. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you very much. Uh, all those in favor? I see no hands available to oppose, so that is a unanimous approval of the appeal 2750, special exception appeal for Elijah Holbrook. This time I'd like to thank also Mr. Holbrook. He did a great job coming to us um, with uh, a potentially challenging group of public that uh, were uh, uh, attempting to assist him. And I think he did a wonderful job, so I want to thank him for that. Um, appeal number 2751, special exception appeal for the uh, home, uh, home occupation by Caitlin Johnson. This was the uh, the, the uh, home bakery, if we'll remember, uh, at uh, 51 Pine Point Road. Did everybody have a chance to read the findings of fact, and do they reflect the uh, meetings from the last month? Can I have a motion to, appeal, to approve? A motion to approve. Thank you. Uh, may I have a second? Second. I think she beat you to it, David. Um, then we uh, may have a vote. Uh, all those in favor of appeal number 2751. The vote is unanimous, and uh, the special exception appeal is finalized. The last is an appeal number 2749, a miscellaneous appeal by Alexander G. Tito, 50, uh, or 565, oh, thank you, uh, at US Route 1. Um, thank you. I didn't see it sneak in there. Thank you. Mr. Tito, thank you very much. So um, with that in mind, we'll invite you to um, come to the front here. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, go through your um, your uh, your request for appeal and uh, fire away. Yeah. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alex Tito. I live at uh, five six five U.S. Route One. 
Um, I, the property I live on is in a TBC3 zone, um, but my understanding, I just purchased the property back in January, um, but my understanding is that the property is a non-conforming use as a residential property on fronting on Route 1. Um, and as a result, any changes or additions to the structure or the property in a structural manner needs to go through approval through you guys. Um, so I filled out the application. I'm looking to place an 8 by 10 uh, A-frame shed uh, towards the back of my property, more away from Route 1. Um, it is six feet tall on the, uh, 6.3 feet height on the walls, nine foot at the peak. Um, it will not have any HVAC, will not have any plumbing, will not have any electric. It is just going to be a box for storing uh, lawn tools and such. Um, I uh, met in front of the, uh, what was it, the planning board a couple of weeks ago for an advisory approval, um, which went swimmingly. Um, they had no concerns. They did note in their approval that the, it was appropriately set back from any watersheds and waterlands. I think it was nearly 300 feet back. Um, and it is, uh, this expansion is in similar use with surrounding properties. Um, so they did not have any concerns. Um, are there any initial questions? Mr. Bork? Yes, I do have a question regarding the exact location of the shed. Sure. On the, diagra on the um, diagram, Yes, you know, Brian, if you could pull that back up. Thank you. Um, it shows the shed encroaching within the setbacks, the co one corner of the shed, no, if you look carefully. No, no, it doesn't. It does okay. not. So the, the corner would be at 15 feet as well if you extrapolate those out. Okay. You see you have a 15-foot line coming through here and a 15-foot yep. line coming through there. That corner does not encroach. That's just a dimension to the back of the shed and a dimension to the end of the shed. Got it. Optical illusion. It is a little. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Brian, so I think I'm orienting the handout that we received earlier. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that up on the, uh, uh, the applicant doesn't, doesn't have this. It wasn't presented. He, he didn't know this existed. I actually remembered that we had an appeal back in 2018, okay. uh, and the survey plan was, was provided, and I thought it might be useful for the board to understand um, more for the shoreland setback, because I had to verify that myself. Okay. How come that won't disappear? There it is. So just for the shoreland setback, Got it. Okay. you see the 75, and I'll enlarge that a little bit more. This says 75 feet from edge of wetland right okay. here. So that's that 75 foot line. Uh, Mr. Tito is proposing to put his shed back here in the corner. So I just wanted to bring that up. Got it. To, okay. To explain so, that he is not in the shoreland. He, he is in the shoreland zone, but he's not uh, in a non-conforming location in the shoreland. Got zone. it. And so just it, can, you've got the little um, arrow there. Mm -hmm. It's up in the upper that right there it's, it's is effectively right where it is. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Got it. And that was my intent as well as to be make sure I'm not getting got it. anywhere close to that. <laughs> no, that's helpful. So, so my my understanding is that you know I originally looked at this because Brian had sent me this. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure it was beyond 75 feet. When I met with the planning board a couple of weeks ago, they had looked on um, an online database I think they had, that the town has at least, um, and were able to measure, and the nearest shoreland that they saw was nearly 300 feet. So I'm not entirely sure where the discrepancy is, but either way, it, it is at least 75 yeah, feet. Yeah, and, and, and I can clarify that. They, they probably went on to our web GIS, mm -hmm. which shows a shoreland zone overlay, yep. but that only indicates that there is shoreland zone in that area. It has to be field verified because it starts at the edge of the wetland. Understood. Uh, or, or the inland edge of the wetland, actually, and goes 200 yeah. feet out. So mm -hmm. that, the, what they were looking at in trying to measure from was not actually accurate. Fair. Although it did, <laughs> it did tell them that there was some shoreland in the area. They sure. just didn't get that right. I but this you. is a much better, this has actually been delineated. You can see the point of Agreed. wetland down here. Agreed. And that was uh, that was delineated, which is still fine. It's yep. still a, a moot point. I just wanted gotcha. to clarify why there might have been a difference. Thank you. Okay. Okay, any other questions at this time? <clears throat> Seeing none, um, I will ask the applicant to read in uh, the uh, responses to the standards for the special exemption. And this is a bit of a uh, pro forma, but this enters into the record your written comments on the verbal record for the meeting. Sure. So um, we'll start with the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its design or operation. 
Correct, yeah, the shed will not contain any plumbing, electrical, or HVAC components, and thus will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions. Thank you. The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Yeah, the shed will be proposed to be placed at the back of the property with 15-foot setback from property lines on the opposite end from Route 1 of my property, and thus will not affect vehicular or pedestrian traffic. Thank you. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood, or require a substantially different degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Yep, the shed is to be used only for personal storage purposes and will not affect public safety. The proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. The shed will not cause sedimentation or erosion, nor will it affect water supplies, as it will not contain any utilities or produce any waste or sewage. Thank you. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Yep, the proposed shed is for storage use only and will be a relatively small physical size and will not significantly affect visual impact of the property or surrounding properties. Development density will not be affected, and that was corroborated by the planning board as well. Great. If located in a shoreland zone as depicted on the Town of Scarborough official shoreland and zoning map, the proposed use will comply with all the requirements of the Town of Scarborough shoreland zoning ordinance. Yep, the property is located in Scarborough shoreland zone overlay. The proposed shed will be placed between 75 feet and 250 feet from the edge of wetlands and will comply with the requirements set forth by the shoreland zoning ordinance. Great. The applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the pro proposed use to be able to carry out the to be able to carry out the proposed use. Yeah, I'm the current owner of the property with a warranty deed, which I've attached in the packet. Thank you. The applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection five of this section. Yep, I'm gonna be purchasing the shed outright and will oversee its installation and placement by the supplying company, Shed Happens of Saco Main. Clever naming. It is. Uh, <laughs> they got <well>, me. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. The shed will not generate any noise within the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Um, with that, do we have any further questions before I ask for any public opinion? Hearing none, oh, sorry, David. Yes, one quick item. Uh, on the section D, the proposed use will not uh, result in sedimentation or erosion. Uh, what provisions are you making for stormwater runoff? Uh, so I'm going to be using a gravel pad to put the shed on top of. Um, which shouldn't affect any of the water flow underneath it, at least. Um, no further provisions beyond that. Is there vegetation in the area to absorb the water? Um, vegetation in terms of what, I'm sorry? Well, shrubs, uh, you know, just any, any kind of vegetation which mm. would absorb the water. I mean, there is, the, the entire um, property there is all grass, um, and then there is vegetation kind of the, there is a, a rundown towards the, the um, wetlands there that does have vegetation in okay. there as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Seeing nothing? Uh, and seeing no public comment, we don't have anything online. Did we receive any public comment? No, nope. Brian? We okay. did not. Then we will close the public comment section and um, we will deliberate here. Um, why don't we start, I think this is fairly straightforward, so I'm just gonna go right down the line. Um, Christy, do you wanna start with uh, item one, The uh, Item A. Do you want him to sit down? Um, you, you're welcome to sit down. This is going to go pretty quickly, so sure. whatever you'd like, yeah. <laughs> Item A, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions. And this proposed shed is for storage of yard and garden tools and will not create any unhealthful emissions. I think that's pretty straightforward. Agreed. I think we're all in, in agreement on that one. Um, Shelly, you want to take item B? Do you want to vote on that? Oh, yeah, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to get through this quickly. It's I apologize. Meeting and you <laughs> um, could I um, uh, uh, could I have a, uh, a show of hands to agree with uh, the uh, findings of fact on A? That is unanimous. So if we could go to B. The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions um, when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. So this shed is going to be in the back of the property and there will be no vehicular 
traffic or pedestrian traffic other than going to and from the shed, I imagine. Um, so I don't see this being a problem with traffic or vehicular, uh, unsafe vehicular traffic. Great. Any comment on that? Could I see agreement by a show of hands? That's unanimous. Um, Mr. Bork, item C. Okay. The proposed use will not, <coughs> excuse me. The proposed use will not create uh, public <coughs> safety problems, uh, which would be substantially different from those uh, created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. And um, so I would say to that, the, the, the property is bordered by uh, other residential properties on each side, and the proposed uh, storage shed will not have any impact on the level of public safety or fire protection beyond the, those adjacent uses. And again, it's just a storage shed, which, which wouldn't require any kind of uh, impact. Agreed. Any disagreement or discussion? If I could see a show of hands for agreement with the final fact, thank you. Um, I'll take item D. The proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. The size of the shed as an eight by 10 shed on a piece of property with um, some vegetation cover but to be replaced by um, a, a, a gravel bed seems very minimal in terms of likelihood of creating any sedimentation or erosion issues and clearly no effect on water supplies. Um, so I believe the applicant has uh, demonstrated that this is fine. Uh, any discussion items or questions? If I could see a show of hands to agree with the finding of fact, terrific. Item E, Joseph. Sure. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and the density of development. Uh, the proposed storage shed is small, relatively small in size, located at the back of the property, um, so won't have any adverse visual impact um, on the property or the adjacent properties, and nobody's living in the shed, so certainly won't impact uh, development density. I think that makes sense. Any discussion? Um, if I could see it in a show of hands for agreement for the finding of fact. Thank you, a unanimous. Um, Mr. Silver. <clears throat> Item F <clears throat> relates to the shoreline zone, and we had some discussion about that earlier. It's not in the shoreline zone, so pretty straightforward in that regard. Agreed. And uh, and, uh, and Brian, you've already commented on that, so that we're, I think we're good on that. Any discussion? Do we just need to add into the record that it's the properties in the shoreline zone, but the where the shed is is not going to be? Right. Sure. Yeah, for the, for the record, the property is in the shoreland zone. The location, the, the proposed location of the shed is a conforming location within, gotcha. within the lot and the shoreland zone. Okay, and I think we've seen a proposed language on that, so we'll include that in the formal findings of fact. Um, so on that basis, do we, uh, do I see a show of hands for agreement with the finding of facts? Terrific, thank you very much. Um, uh, bring it back to, down to... Item G, the applicant G. has sufficient right title and interest to the proposed site. The applicant, applicant appellant has provided a copy of his deed to demonstrate his right. Agreed. Any discussion on that? We can see a show of hands for the finding of facts. Terrific. Um, Shelly? Uh, H, so the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Um, I'm super glad I got this one because I get to say shed happens <laughs> on record. Um, so he'll be purchasing this um, outright and um, he provided the cost and they're going to install it in their professional company out of Saco. I would just also like to add, thank you for going through all the steps you have for this shed, because we understand that you've had to go to several meetings okay. to do this the way that it, the I right way. So uh, I appreciate that. The process is in place for certain reasons, and I respect that. <laughs> thank you. Bravo. Terrific. Um, on that basis, and with thanks from the entire board, uh, may I see a show of hands for the finding of facts? Well, Correct. Wait a minute. You, you, wasn't that just H? 
Yes. Yes. So we still have one more. Yeah, yes. but that, the, the show of hands for that finding fact. Oh, that finding. I thought yeah. you meant the whole thing. No, 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 no. Um, the last one is Mr. Board. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. Well, it's a shed, so that doesn't really have very much impact, obviously. Um, but um, it will it'll, it'll gener not generate any appreciable noise or, uh, or be incompatible to uh, hours of, of use and so forth. Gotcha. Agreed. Um, any discussion? And may I have a show of hands for the finding of facts? Unanimous. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, on that basis, that was unanimous on all items. Could I have a motion to appeal, or excuse me, not to appeal, approve. to approve the appeal? So moved. Thank you, David. Do we have a second? I'll second. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Silkman. Um, and uh, then I will ask for an up or down vote on the appeal number 2749, the miscellaneous appeal of Alexander G. Tito, 565 Route 1. Um, may I see, uh, see a show of hands? The vote is unanimous. The appeal is accepted. Thank you, Mr. Tito. Thank you for Thank you dealing with the, uh, all right, of us. You. Enjoy your shed. <laughs> exactly. Enjoy your shed. Indeed. <laughs> Please don't decide to Airbnb that. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Good night. Not too small. It was pretty nice. <laughs> so um, I think we've got one real item to go over tonight. Um, we, we wanted to talk about the uh, remote meeting uh, uh, protocol, um, and then we'll go to zoning board comments. But uh, I will open this up to my colleagues, and how do we want to start this off? Yeah. Mr. Silpin. <clears throat> First, Doreen, thank you very much for sending us the policies of the other committees. You're welcome. Uh, you know, in looking through <clears throat> the policies of the other committees compared to ours, I mean, ours is identical with one very small exception. I stand there. Right? If we add to our policy <clears throat> what is A.2 A of the town council and B.2 of all of the other committees, mm -hmm. our policy will accommodate remote meetings yep. and it will be consistent with all of the other boards and commissions yep. that exist in Scarborough. So what I would <clears throat> like to do is make a motion yep. that we modify our remote participation policy to add, and I'll just use the one off of the town council, their <clears throat> section A.2 and incorporate that into our section B of uh, the document. Could you just read that into the record, uh, Richard, just so we sure. have it on the, the record? <clears throat> Their section <clears throat> A.2 says, for individual members, well, let me, let me back up. Um, it's the title of the section is limited in scope, and it says the council members are expected to be physically present, except when being physically present is not practicable, including the following circumstances. One, the existence of an emergency or urgent issue that requires the full council to meet remotely. That <clears throat> provision is already in our document. Mm -hmm. Two, for individual members of the council, A, illness or other physical condition, or B, temporary absence from the jurisdiction where traveling to the meeting would cause the member to face significant difficulties to attend in person. It is <clears throat> that those provisions under item A.2 that would be incorporated into our remote participation policy under the section B limited in scope. Mr. Silkman has some mood. Is there a second for the motion? Mrs. Snow, um, or Ms. Snow, thank you very much. Um, so we have a second. Um, so we'll open that up to discussion. Um, yeah, want to start it off with Ms. Snow, what do you think? Um, I'm very comfortable with it. I think it's fine to make it more uniform and to give more opportunities for members like Mr. Silkman who aren't here for <laughs> the, the uh, cold weather months. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm fine with it. I, I think that as long as we're not taking advantage of that, you know, that's pretty vague. So, um, but I, yeah, I think, I think that that covers a lot of different situations. So I'm, I'm all right with it. Okay. Mr. Borg. Okay. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, as far as I know, and Brian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, all of the boards and committees in the town of Scarborough have alternates. Um, I may be wrong. You know, there may be one out there that doesn't. I, they, they all have alternates as part of their charters. I'm not sure they're all filled right now. But well, it doesn't I, matter if they're filled or not. Yeah, yeah. No, the, but to your yeah. point, yes, they, they all yeah. have alternates, yes. Yeah, but the idea of having alternates is so that you can always have a quorum in a meeting. So for us, the quorum is four. You know, we have five regulars and two alternates. That's a total of seven. So you can still have three people absent from a meeting, and you still have a quorum, and we can still function. Mm -hmm. I've been um, on boards in other communities, and um, they don't, you know, both, both of those uh, communities did not have alternates. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was difficult at times in order to have a quorum. You could just have one person missing and still have a... A, 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 you know, a quorum, but if you had two missing, you couldn't function. Uh, I think our situation is unique here. I see no need for this. Um, I think that on a very rare occasion where three people might be ill uh, for some reason, um, you still have a quorum. If four people are out, then you've got a problem. Now, what are the chances of four out of seven being out? I say it's very slim. And for that reason, I oppose this. Okay, thank you. I'm going to keep my comments for the end. So, um, Mr. Doherty, if you have, would like to comment? Yes, thanks. So, I, I think ultimately what we're here to do is serve the public. And I, I think in, in the public's interest, it's best if a board can meet in person. Yeah, and, and we face the, the applicants um, and they us. Uh, so, you know, along with what Mr. Bork said, I think, I, I think if, if we can find a way of, of, of writing it, and, and I agree with the additions, but writing it in a way that sort of says, if a quorum is possible in person using an alternate or alternates, then the meeting should be held in person and, and all the attendees in person. If that's not possible, then it's fine for one or more of the board members to attend remotely um, in order to not, you know, delay the findings in the cases uh, in front of us. Gotcha. I like that idea. I think you guys bring up a good point. I support that also. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Silver? <clears throat> one of the things that the policy does p permit <clears throat> is remote participation by applicants. Now, we haven't had that occasion because they have appeared before us. Um, <clears throat> but I think that given that we are televising this, that it's available to be participated in remotely by applicants, that that same consideration ought to apply to members of the board. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think that this is really a question of a quorum I think this is much more a question of technology and how technology functions today versus how it functioned a decade ago or two decades ago. I mean, we have the capability now to remotely conduct meetings. We did it <clears throat> for an entire year, and I don't think that the public suffered in any way, at least I certainly didn't hear any complaints about remote participation. I think it's time that <clears throat> not only this board, but all boards begin to recognize the capability of technology and become more comfortable with it, more familiar with it, because it is becoming a much more significant part of our life. <clears throat> I think if <clears throat> the board wanted to push more aggressively to have public part, you know, to have on-site participation using the alternates, instead of using the appointed members, then that's a reasonable approach to take. But I think in the, in the final analysis, it ought to be up to the individual member. The member can't participate for whatever reason. 
<clears throat> whether the member is ill and needs to be at home or the member is traveling but could participate. You know, you, you were traveling, you could have participated. Uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I think that that's something that the board member ought to make the decision of and the rest of the board ought to be comfortable with that decision. So while I don't see any particular problem with striving for participation in, in person, <clears throat> I don't think that that should be a limiting factor. So I would stick with the motion as I proposed it. Okay. Um, Still. That does raise a question for me about when you were traveling and I was here and conducted the meeting. So would your, would this remote policy mean that you would be chairing the meeting remotely even though we were all here? How does it change that? The way that Mr. Silkman has phrased the motion, and, I'm, and just to say that's how you phrase, phrase the motion, yes, that's how it would work. So I would be chairing remotely even though everyone else were were present, was present. Um, excuse me on the grammar. You, you, you understand what I'm saying. So yes, given the, the wording, that's how it would work. Ms. Bork. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah that's a good point. <laughs> okay, so uh, if I, regarding the technology point, I think that's well taken, by the way. Uh, however, uh, I think the town of Scarborough has shown that during the pandemic, they were not capable of, in, of ensuring the safety and security of, um, of our remote meetings. We've had, we had problems during those meetings. Oh, God, yeah. And I, about that. I really don't want us to have to adopt any kind of a policy change that could result in being in that situation again until the town of Scarborough can assure us that they're on top of this and know how to use the technology properly and safely. I, don't, I mean, I'm not sure what assurances that you want. <clears throat> I can't imagine the town council would have adopted this proposal if it felt that it could not securely conduct public meetings remotely with members sitting in remotely. Um, I, I'm not aware of any inability of the town of Scarborough to do what every other town in the state of Maine can do and do it reasonably well. Um, if there's something that you know about that <clears throat> I don't know about, please share it because I'm not aware of any, any inability to perform remote meetings. We remember, yeah, we remember. Can I address that? Yeah, yeah, sure, of course, Brian, of course. Okay, and I, I appreciate Dave's comments, but, but let me put it in context. That particular meeting, right from the get-go, there was a confusion about booking the meeting on Zoom there was sort of emergency scramble to get a, a link that you all could use. The proper procedure wasn't used. That was done by the IT professional that was helping us. That was a one-time occurrence. It has never happened again. All of these other boards use the hybrid meeting. I don't believe there has been that problem since. We had one other occasion where they, they, couldn't, they failed to be able to connect for whatever reason. That was very early on in the, in, the, in the COVID stages, okay? So I, I think we now have a track record. All of these other committees, every meeting have a hybrid meeting using the technology. It has not failed to my knowledge any, any time since then. So, so for the last, let's say the last two years, it's worked pretty darn well. So let's put that whole thing to bed. Let's not bring that up again because I don't think that's a reasonable excuse anymore. Let's put that to bed. Let's just, do you want to do it or not? Let's not talk about whether the town has the capability. The town has proven it has the capability because they've conducted umpteen hundred meetings in the last two years through all of these committees that do a hybrid meeting, okay? Respectfully, I'll, I'll submit that. I think we need to put that argument to bed. Uh, Mr. Bork first, then Mr. I'll withdraw my comment uh, <laughs> in, because of uh, Brian's assurance that uh, there will no, never be problems again. Well, uh, <laughs> let, me be, let me be clear. I don't have a crystal ball. I'm sure there could be problems again. I don't think there'll be those problems again. If I could quote the great <laughs> Alfred Broccoli film producer, never say never again. But um, Ms. Snow, you want to mention something? 
I, yeah, Brian. Um, so do the other boards have a hierarchy? I mean, if the chair were traveling, does the vice chair travel, uh, um, chair the meeting in their absence? I don't know the answer to that. Oh. I like the idea of a hierarchy that those who can be in attendance should and... This is an, oh, go ahead, sorry. sorry. Can, can we just make it so that the highest ranking person in person chairs the meeting? That's what I, I was going to add. So I'm also on the long range planning committee today. And um, today our chairman was remote. Everyone else was in person. And, and I think even the chairman, Alan Paul, would admit that it was very difficult to chair the meeting remotely. It especially. sounds annoying, yeah. it to does. be honest with you. Um, and and, I, and I, I think the approach that we've kind of talked about has two elements. I, I, I agree. I think participation should be allowed remotely, but I think the chairing of the meeting should be conducted by the highest ranking member who is present in the room. And I've got one other suggestion, too, and I'll see what we kind of come up with, which is, um, uh, and this may or may not work. I'm going to throw, I'm going to, uh, this is a proposal. It's um, if, if an alternate is present but a voting member is participating remotely, then the alternate may be raised to the voting member and, the, and, and effectively the, the voting member is deemed to be absent for the meeting. Um, they'll still participate, just like the alternates are, are offer their opinions and things like that. It's, um, it's a proposal, Brian. Come on. And, and it, it, it's kind of a hearing, pulling together some of the threads that I've heard here. But one of the things I would say, it does sound like the chair should be, or the chair of the meeting should be someone who is present. So if I can't be there, I'm still a voting member, but I probably shouldn't be holding the gavel. And what's the point of holding the gavel in your room? Especially, I also, I, I really wanted to mention this. The only complaint that I had about remote meetings was watching uh, David's tropical backdrop on his Zoom. So, um, in, so I, I would highly recommend anyone who can't make the meeting, not especially in February, have a tropical palm tree and gentle ocean breezes in the background. But with that being said, I like the idea that the senior ranking member present is the chair of the meeting. And then I'll open up to further suggestions. And I'll first ask Mr. Silkman, who raised the motion, to offer some his thoughts. <clears throat> I think that's a reasonable approach and would accept that as a friendly amendment to my motion. Yeah, got it. Yeah, a yeah. couple points. Uh, first of all, there are only two officers here mm -hmm. uh, on the board. Uh, therefore, it doesn't go beyond that. So it, it either the chair or the vice chair has to be present. Let me ask that question from Brian. I, well, no, it's, it, I mean, it's a fair point that the problem, the thing is, the vice chair and the chair could both be sick on yeah. one meeting. Then it's up to the members present to elect a chair for the meeting. That's the standard procedure. So okay. it's not like, yeah, it's not like you're, you're committed to have to be here come hell one of the two of us. Yeah, exactly. One of the it's, two of us. But, but yeah. yeah, I mean, if one of you is here, then that, that solves that problem, right. but in, in, in the event that I, neither of you can be here, then the board members present would elect a chair for that meeting. Yeah. Right? That's you fine. just say. Right. So that solves that one. Yeah. Second point, all right. Uh, my opinion, okay. If we have a quorum minimum present, physically present, it's okay for, uh, if, if we're going to allow remote participation, mm -hmm. that's fine, but I think that the voting should, uh, should only be permitted by people who are physically present. The people who are remote can certainly offer their opinions and comments, et cetera. But I would simply say that, you know, again, I think it's, it's only appropriate that the people who are physically here, as long as we have a quorum, should be the people who vote on things. Okay. Um, I, Michelle? I disagree. I think if you're participating in the meeting, I. What I would propose we do is say, is adopt this second part, uh, you know, two B uh, in the limited scope, and then also, you know, do a two C and say, the chair cannot chair remotely; it has to be somebody physical. That's my proposal. I don't think it. I needs think to we know what you're talking about. We'll have to develop some language that's a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah no, but, but my, yeah, I think we know what you're talking about. Yeah. My vernacular needs to be real, <laughs> really sharpened up there. But um, 
But uh, I I don't know. I don't I don't think that we need to go into like crazy detail about quorums and stuff. But if you guys think we, I mean, I'm I'm open to it. I just I think we should keep it simple. Mr. Chair, well, I'll let the board go first. Oh. Oh. Miss Snow first. Go go. So, I agree with I I, I like everyone's input. However. Um, what does it mean to be an alternate? I mean, with a remote policy, it sort of means an alternate never has, uh, is, is never elevated to a voting member. That's what it looks like to me. There, there, <clears throat> there could be times when people are just incapacitated or can't participate. Yeah. And in those instances, <clears throat> the alternate would be available. I mean, we've had those, you know, we've had those examples. If we had a meeting while Peter was in Italy, he may have said, I'm not sitting in this thing. I'm, yeah. I'm going to a Trattoria at six, yeah. you know, so seven at nice, night is, is, is <laughs> but also <laughs> seven, you know, seven at night is one in the morning there, and he's not going to do that remotely. I guarantee you. I would. <clears throat> and so, I, I, you know, I do think that there'll be plenty of opportunities for alternates to participate, even with a remote participation. I, there certainly was when we were remotely meeting during the COVID situation. I was an alternate then and was participating in a number of meetings. And I think even, as I've observed on this committee, the, even when people are alternates, we still invite them to participate in um, their opinion on findings of fact and review of, the, of that. And certainly I found that valuable. I, and, and whether or not they're a voting member or an alternate, I think their participation in the process um, gives them that. that. So I'm, I'm not so worried about that as well. And, and yeah, you're right, certainly I travel a lot and there are going to be times where I simply will not, I'll be at a business dinner in Washington, D.C. or whatever and I can't uh, attend and then you would chair and we would pop up and uh, the, uh, Ms. Doherty in that case would become a voting member for that, that meeting or I think, you, I think, I think you were here. Yeah. So, um, so on that light, I think I, I'm inclined to agree with, um, with Michelle. I, I think we keep it simple. We adopt the language that Mr. Silkman had in his motion and amend his motion to include a statement that the chair shall always be present, which means that if, therefore the chair, if the chair cannot be present, the vice chair will take over. If the vice chair and the chair can both not be present, the attending members will elect a temporary chair for the meeting. And then I think we call it a day on that and we, we amend our remote participation policy as uh, on that basis. Joe? Just one, one, and I agree with, uh, first of all, great discussion and, and agree with, uh, with the proposal as amended. Um, just want to point out that uh, with respect to having the chair be present, um, we just need to write language to make sure that in the event of an emergency where we're not meeting in person, yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I think that is always superseded by the item A, which is if we're under operating under emergency orders, we're operating under emergency orders. Right. So I think we're good on that one. Kind of a different deal too. It's a different deal then too because everybody's remote. So Correct. You don't yep. have that awkwardness of the Correct. chair being remote and everybody else being here. Exactly. Person. Exactly. So um, could I have a motion to amend as discussed? So moved. Mr. Silkman, thank you. A uh, uh, second for the motion to amend? I'll second that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, then if there's no further discussion, I think we've had a good discussion. I appreciate this from, oh, no, nope, Dave is going to discuss. Uh, I think it would be wise at this point to uh, take, uh, take the time to draft this and come back a month from now. Okay. And at that time, vote on it. Okay. And, or make further amendments to what it is that's proposed. Okay. Um, is that a motion to table? I think that would be, do you no. want to make a motion to table? We could do that. I, no. yes, it's not uh, a bad idea, frankly. Yeah, I, I will make a motion to table. Okay. A second? Second. Second. Could we have a, a vote on the motion to table on the consideration of the amendment of our remote participation policy? Uh, show of hands in favor? Four. Against? One. Four, one to table. And. If I could ask, um, uh, Doreen, could you draft some language that kind of puts this together? So my guess is this will be a quick discussion next meeting, but we'll have the actual language in front of us. And we've tossed into some vernacular, some bad grammar. We've all had kind of 
struggled to get this right on the page. So help us out on that one. I'd also Thank like you. to pass it by legal just to make sure that yeah. we have Fair enough. Yeah, that, that's, that's helpful. That's, that's part of my that's rationale. Helpful. I didn't say yeah. it. The only other thing I would add is that it, it is very, very important that we... Actually, hold on one second. Motion to table approved. Thank you. Uh, it's very important that we um, understand our responsibilities to the public to have a quorum present at all times. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that sometimes we struggle with, especially if we don't have enough alternates. Right now, we're fortunate that we have yeah. alternates. Yeah. And we have a great deal of flexibility in the way we do this. Yeah. But there will be times you know, in the future when we are missing one or two alternates. And, it makes it very difficult for us to function. And I think more than most boards, we've wrestled with that. And that makes us more sensitive than, say, the planning board or the, uh, the, even the town council um, to the reality that this can happen. Um, so I think if we adopt something slightly different, that's OK, because we, we have direct experience as a zoning board of the risks of that lack of a quorum. So I appreciate that, Mr. Borkin. It's a good final comment. With that, um, we will move on to any other comments from the board? Seeing none, may I have a mo Uh, I will be out actually next meeting, <laughs> having said that, how go. important a quorum is. <laughs> Thank you. It's for my 10th wedding anniversary. Oh, sorry, congratulations. Yeah. And on behalf of the board, we congratulate. <laughs> <laughs> we congratulate Ms. Stevenson on her 10th wedding anniversary next month. Had uh, we passed this tonight, that amendment, you would have been able to participate remotely <laughs> on your anniversary. <laughs> My husband what could have been more, what could have been a better <laughs> yeah, it would have gone over well I'm sure in the Stevenson household um, so uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> honey I'll be back I just need to be a quorum so uh, yeah that's gonna work out well um, thank you everyone for uh, your attendance tonight if there's no further comment may I have a motion to adjourn mr. Bork thank so you motion to second second. Second, uh, Ms. Steve, thank you. Uh, all in favor, thank you. This meeting is adjourned.